I'm really proud of the, the culture of music that we have, which is why I wanted to get this book going, really, it was because we listen to a lot of music, we go to games, but it's nice to talk about it, to read about it as well. And most of the books I have at home are music books, but from different countries and record labels and bands. But it wasn't, this book didn't exist. So I was really frustrated by that. And so, yeah. So what was the process then? Well, that initial concept. Yeah. How did you go about the, there's one thing, oh, I've got a great idea. Yeah. And then a publisher agrees, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And then you're left with the job of writing oh, it. Writing oh, it. I know, it's the worst bit to write. It's the actual writing. It's, 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 it's terrible. It's it's terrible. terrible. Well, it's stressful. I don't know how you do it. Um, I, con I contacted the publishers eight years ago. I emailed them, oh, what about this? And they went, great. And as you said, nothing happened then for about five years. Um, and then I stuck my wife one day just went, come on, you've got to actually do this now. Stop dreaming about it, make it happen, you know. So I was lucky. I knew it would sell. I knew it would be popular because it's the kind of book that I would buy. And I'm a music fan, so I went ahead and did it. The first record I wrote about was this one called Welsh Folk Songs, sung by Marentine Evans. And it's actually one of the earliest records. It's 1954 this came out. And uh, it was, he, Miranda Evans was from um, the St 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 area, and he, moved, he was studying in Princeton University to do, to do a PhD. Um, somebody told me recently, Cal Cal Jones told me recently, he was also in the book, he'd say good morning to somebody every morning on the, on the, in front of the uni. Good morning, good morning. Turns out later on he figured out he was Albert Einstein. <laughs> so he was in this decision as I said. So you know, so well back. But he sung some demos for Folk Wage Records, uh, run by Alan Lomax, who would go around the world collecting sounds from different parts of the world and uh, bringing them to New Year's. And he heard the Red Devils from Wales. So we got him into a studio in New York and he sang a cappella. It's all on streaming services, this album, if you want to listen to it. Um, and they released it and it, it was like a top 10 record in the New York Times in 1954. Um, and his influence on Welsh traditional artists, trad musicians today is enormous because him and Phyllis Kidney, his wife, who's American, would collect all of these songs. I just remember they feature in your film. They come to visit. Gwynwell Evans in yeah. Rogers' film Assume, when he did the start of S4C, telling you the plot here, he knows your film. And the Red and Evans and Finnish don't they? Yeah. And uh, it's like this it. But they were, you know, realize, they wouldn't have realised at the time the, the work that they were doing, collecting and documenting these traditional songs was incredibly important. Massively important. Songs, Gareth Bonello, the gentle bird, sings a song on his new album. It's a, the first song on the album is a song sung by a prisoner in prison in Dolgatha. And the only reason it still exists is because Loretta Evans spoke to someone who spoke to someone who spoke to the prison guard who remembers this song being sung. And has kept it. I mean, it gives me shivers just talking about it, the idea of that, before any sort of recording. And, and Gareth Bonello singing it. Iggy Pop played it on a show on Six Music a couple of months ago. You know, it's remarkable. So I suppose, thankfully, because Buried was a hoarder of tra traditional and folk songs, you know, it's influenced by Cara Jenkins and Callan in Swansea and all of the trad artists and all the artists who want to do something new with folk music now, like Nainbach and, um, I mean, so sort of William Boyd Reese and many, many others. Um, yeah, so it's really, really important. Well, I, uh, I mentioned this to you. I, I obviously there are a hundred, a hundred records. Hundred, only hundred. We, we, well, we could talk about the hundred, but we'd be here for a very long time. So I, I tried to just do a distillation of ones that we could start talking about. Sure, so yeah. No way, we going to end up. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, two disclaimers. Yeah. I've, I've never said these are the best hundred records in Wales. And I've never said that, you know, these are the definitive, this is, and it's not a top one, it doesn't go under to number one. I showed the book to Kenny from the Stereophonics, and he went, oh, we're number one. Which <laughs> <laughs> shows their mentality, popular band. <laughs> but I'm there, there just to pull in uh, people who go, oh, this looks interesting, I've heard of them, I'm not going to go, hopefully. 
Uh, other than, you know, otherwise I'm going to put Dial N for Merthyr and yeah. a compilation album, you know, or, I don't know, uh, the Gower 19 year film time. But, um, yeah, so that, that just as a disclaimer. Good, good. Because I, I was going to ask, I was going to ask you whether <coughs> there were 100 records that you, that you particularly like. Or they have a Or whether it yeah. makes sense of the breadth um, and the depth. Oh, music. Yeah, well, some of them I adore, like the Testion that I mentioned. A lot of them I absolutely, you know, they're all good. Um, some I absolutely love. Some I've never heard. Like, I haven't heard that <laughs> until I bought it in the second hand of the shop. And, I mean, it's Bonnie. I've met Bonnie. I'm a fan. I've heard the hits. But I haven't sat down from start to finish listening to Faster Than the Speed of Night. There's a, can you read that little bit on the back? It says, um, whole taping is killing music. Yeah. Which, you know, that was the big thing, wasn't it, back then? Don't take music, otherwise Bonnie will get the five pounds or whatever. Um, but it's a great record produced by Jim Steinman. So some of them I thought, oh, it should be in the book. Yeah. It would be fun to put in the book. For example, The Flying Pickets. <laughs> Lost Points. I hadn't listened to that before. I'd heard the hits. I'd heard. <laughs> Every Christmas, I told you I couldn't sing, right? Um, That's quite good. <laughs> uh, but I had listened to that from start to finish, and it's, it's amazing. There's a version of Marvin Gaye I heard, it was a great fine. Um, Psycho Killer by Talking Heads is in it. Um, so there's some records that I knew had a story. So every book, every record in the book, I think, has a story. Well, sometimes that's more important than the actual record. I'm not uh, reviewing the records in the book. I'm not critiquing them. I'm talk, almost talking more about the story about the band and how the record came about and what was happening around the world and in Wales at the time. I found the music. Well, it's, it was funny that you, the first thing you took out was Bobby. Oh, yeah. It is. I, I was. Um, I was, in preparation for today, I wanted to choose an artist who was local, um, or had roots locally. Yeah. And Bonnie Tyler was one of the local artists. Is she coming in? Is she coming in? Tell you what, that far half just going to fly away. Probably going to pick your own reason. You mounted it across the <laughs> um, but um, page ninety eight, um, you have body, and oh, yeah. you said something. I wasn't. I, you said something when you were talking about this that you met Bonnie Tyler. When did you first meet Bonnie Tyler? I've only met her once. When you're, um, I was invited to. This doesn't happen very often. I was invited to the opening of a clothes shop in London to D London in Cardiff to DJ. Bonnie Tyler was there. I've never done it before. It's the only time I've ever been invited to DJ in a clothes shop. <laughs> and I've still got a photo on my phone, yeah, yeah. And it was probably about, I don't know, 15 years ago. I'm not, it's like one of the big chain shops, like, I don't remember, but Stephen Parry was organising it as a party organiser. Yeah, yeah. So I was going, yeah, I can DJ. And uh, yeah, that's the only time I think I've ever met Bonnie, or Gaynor, Gaynor. as she was called. Yeah. Did you talk about the music with her? I don't think we had time. No, I don't think so. And also, like, unless you, yeah, I, 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 I unless you're a massive fan, and you know, I don't feel comfortable uh, talking to people, yeah. you know, you don't hassle people, do you? Because she's there, she's famous, and, you know, it's getting a photo taken. So I'm going to ask you now, why is she, why is she in the book? Well, because she's got an she's still got an amazing voice, and she's also still massively popular, and still works very very hard in a lot of you know when you go to the Glastonbury, the, the European equivalent of Glastonbury in France or Belgium or Poland, often Bonnie will be on the main stage. She's still seen as a relevant, cool artist, whereas. Here, you probably wouldn't. She might be in the legend slot at some point. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Glass to be But, you know, um, I think because she's, you know, she's been around for such a long time, she's associated with the 80s. 
And I mean, you know, that's an incredible album cover, isn't it? Um, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's why, really. I mean, she's one of the, I mean, who'd have to be in the book? Tom, Shirley, um, Bobby, I would put in there, Shaking Stevens, Max Boyce, they're all in the book. <laughs> because, um, you know, I was thinking about what to, I, I wanted this book to, to travel as well, you know, I wanted people across the UK to read it. And who do they think of? Because I've said to people when I was doing the book, I'm doing 100 records, and they name four or five, you know, who else is there? Yeah. And you go, well, that's the point, really. I mean, Jude Rogers is called for the book, I love at the beginning, because she's a writer, music critic, and she says, all too often, Welsh music's power, magic, and depth is reduced to a few familiar names. Um, this book is a blazing corrective. And so I hate the idea of, you know, people going, okay, actors from Wales, Anthony Hopkins, Michael Sheen, Richard Burton, who else is there? There's, there's loads, but if you, you know, if, if, you know, if you go dig in and think a bit harder, and it's the same with records, really. Um, and of course, this is, you know, I, I mentioned in the intro, it's very Welsh, but I apologise in the intro of the book, you know, I make excuses for myself going, there's not much jazz or opera in the book, and I list artists who aren't in here, like Bryn Terfel, Iris Williams, Julian Cope, Charlotte Church, you know, like big, big names, automatic, darling birds and so on. So, um, yeah, I wanted Bobby in it because she's still great and uh, she, she still has hits, you know, took the clips of her heart, went back to number one in the US when there was an eclipse. I think, was that earlier this year? I think it was. Yeah. It's amazing. She is one of the great ones, I suppose. Yeah. So if you were able to kind of when you, when I turn on ITV and I see Tom Jones on The Voice, I think, wow, to have had the journey that he's had through music and the adversity, and to still be on prime time TV at his age. Yeah. You know, there, there aren't many people um, you could say could do that. No. Like in a Welsh context, there's an even smaller pool of people. That's right. And his voice and Bobby's voice are still like peak, probably because I should imagine they use it every day. Yeah. You know, Tom said to me, I've been interviewed twice, and he said, if, you know, I can't stop singing. It's unthinkable. Because he just, he's Tom the Box, isn't he? Um, and that's how it's probably still at its peak. And, and that's why he's probably still on The Voice, because, you know, people's star comes and goes as well. And there's been times when Tom's had to um, play gigs that he probably didn't want to play and be the hip swinging Tom Jones. And then something happened, didn't it? And that's why the record I chose from Tom in the book, uh, you know. I could have got the greatest hits or reload is it could have been in there but i went for one of his more recent albums um surrounded by time where he's kind of in this part of his career towards the end of his career i guess where he looks back at the gospel and the roots and the hymns that he was singing in Treforest. Mm. Um, my dad was also from Treforest. when i first met tom jones i say to him was from Treforest, you know, we talk about Meadow Street and the Ocky Arms and all of that, what school my dad went to, where he went to and stuff. And then uh, I see him about 10 minutes later, and he's clearly forgotten my name, and he just goes, Treforest. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thrilled with, you know, it's a nice name, actually. Forest, isn't it? Yeah. You're like Forest and Forest. <coughs> but, um, yeah, that's the book, The Surrounded by Time from Tom Jones, so I put that one in there. And I got a quote from Tom. I mean, when that quote from Tom came in, I was like, right, it's the end of the book now. It's done, you know, no more playing around with it. And, um, so, yeah, I think he enjoyed looking at it. And, <laughs> oh, well, well, he says, uh, who has really dug in here? Cracking open the wide and wonderful world of Welsh popular music. This research and knowledge is impeccable. Coming up with a fun and informative read for everyone to enjoy. That was a Tom Jones voice. He's the way to the concert. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, that was the point. I wanted you know, all those things in there next to Slubish Shake Thug with T. Gwydid, um, next to H. Hawkline, next to Public Service Broadcasting yeah. um, with the album about the mining. That's an amazing album. It is an amazing album. It's one of, there's about three or four artists in the book who aren't Welsh, but the album is about Wales. 
and that's one of them. Uh, recorded in Edward Vale, uh, with lots of Welsh vocalists joining them. They do concept albums when they public service broadcasting. So the latest album's about Amelia Earhart, the, the flat, flyer, what's the uh, pilot, <laughs> thank you, thank you, the pilot, uh, aviator, even better. Um, but yeah, so that's one in there. Um, Paul Robeson is one of the non-Welsh artists in the book, but with the trio Male Voice Choir. And that's an amazing album. Um, that again is available on streaming services to listen to. Um, What's so special about it? Well, it's, um, it's that, so obviously, I mean, Paul was, Paul also was a, a world famous movie star, wasn't he? And he'd, he'd heard a choir sing in Wales, uh, in London, a Welsh choir sing in London, he fallen in love with Welsh. They um, befriended him, and uh, this massive relationship started, and it's the height of the civil rights movement, and his passport is confiscated by the US government who think he's a spy. Yeah. And so this concert is the Chioki Male Voice Choir in um, uh, Portugal, in Portugal, thanks, 1957 again, and Paul Robeson's in New York, and they sing back and forth to each other. And uh, Will Painter, I think his name is, who's the, um, uh, who's the, the um, conductor of the Chioki Male Voice Choir, says to Paul, you know, we send our love and our, our th thoughts to you and he speaks back and he does an English language version of Hey Laugh and Hand Um And yeah, it's a really powerful, emotional record. Have you got it? Please pass it back. It's not a good Yeah, it's a But yeah, so that was, that's one of the, Americans who sing about Wales. Um, there's a producer in the book called Dangerous as well, who has an album called Of Snowdonia. That's a really great record. And um, who's the other? Who else? There's, um, yeah, there's a, uh, those two. I think, I think that public since broadcasting album, though, when, when I discovered it, I just, it was, it was just so impressive that they basically, they basically look at the, uh, uh, the, the coal mining industry in Wales mm. as, a, as a concept, and that, that they use that the, the landscape has been scarred by coal mining um, as the inspiration um, for an entire, an entire album. Yeah. And just the the sound of it, the amazing sound that, that, that they that they create, it's it's, uh, it's worth a list if you have to. And they use the voices of the miners, don't they, throughout as well? Yeah, and quotes them. from news clips when the yeah. miners strike. Yeah, and the families of the miners as well, the wives, talking about, you know, their husbands going off to work and things like that. It's, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really emotional. I just remember the other non Welsh band in the book, the Birds, and they, because I put the Bells of Rumney in, or as they say, the Bells of Rimney. <laughs> and I went in the book, it's the wrong pronunciation. Because I think, so it's the poem, isn't it, by uh, Idris Davis, and then Pete Seeger records the words and turns it into a song, but it pronounces it as the bells of Rimney. And every version since then is they say Rimney and not Rumney. And uh, I, I, I got paranoid thinking maybe Rimney is the right pronunciation. I should, what I should do is go to Rumney. And just sit there and ask him, where are we? And see what people say. <laughs> and if people say, I do a little chat. Kill some people at the police camp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. From Neil Rimley. But even Mike Peters from The Alarm, who's Welsh, mm. sings Rimley in, in their version as well. So I don't know. But all these things have been like fascinating. And, uh, and you know, each, each, each record tells a story. I mean, the Bells of Rimley slash Rimley is a beautiful poem about Wales, which has travelled the world. She is the version. You know, um, it's become like a standard almost, like a folk trad standard, so classic. So, and uh, that's because I've always been jealous of the Irish because their music has travelled the world, isn't it? It went to America and it came back with the American take on it. So, I like <coughs> to find stories that have travelled outside of Wales and who's, who remind us of, of who we are, which you know, is why, and the other one I mentioned, I had to put Max in, you know, I had to put the old doctor's papers. Um, 
And you know, you'll, as we all know, we'll find this album in every charity shop for like 50p. Almost every charity shop in Wales will have it. Not, well, that's not a diss, but it's because it's sold like six million copies. Well, when I was reading the book and I, I turned the page and I saw that, yeah. I thought, yes, it's, you know, I was surprised to see it there. But then my next thought was, but no, absolutely, because mm. you're talking about records. We might think of him as, you know, any things, but he's like the poet, yeah. the comedian. But, um, however, we had a copy of that record in my house when I was, when I was growing up. Yeah. It's like Ryan Davis's record. Yeah, yeah. Ryan and the Man. People, people have that. Uh, they, they were big, big records. They were. And, you know, for my generation, it's, it's you know, it's the world before the internet, isn't it? And the, the only editing you could have, you couldn't go on YouTube to watch these clips. You had to have the record um, for you to enjoy it. Um, and the TV and radio was, once it was on and you missed it, you'd never see it again, possibly. Which is why I don't mind repeats now on telly, because, well, you know, I didn't see it the first time. But, yeah, records were king. That's why they sold so many. And that's why a lot of the Welsh language seven inches in the book um, sold so many as well. The Tony Akalomas, because if you were a Welsh speaker and wanted Welsh language entertainment, there was even less of it. So records meant even more then, I suppose, because it was one of the only outlets for the language to be in people's homes. If it wasn't in a magazine or a book or a newspaper, you had to own the record. You'd have two hours of Welsh language on BBC TV, and you'd have you know less radio. So you know these things were even more valuable and treasured then, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the great things as well is obviously a physical item. It is, it is the, it is the, it is the, an object that you're buying. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you at some point in this conversation about the. Challenges, were the challenges of being able to reproduce the artwork. Yes, um, because this is, one of, this is one of the fantastic. I mean, this, it could be a copy table. It could be a, That's the idea. You know, it just could be full of full of pictures. Yes, but it sort of is a coffee table book. I wanted it to be that. I wanted to be. I didn't want. This isn't a heavy. It's a great book if you want to learn about the nineties boom. It's a book by Neil Collins called International Velvet, which has just come out. Um, that's a, a really in-depth and well research. I want this to be a nice book to flick through and go, oh look, fewer for a friend or a bad finger, no dice. Um, I want it to look nice because the covers do speak for themselves. Yeah. But in terms of getting permission to use them, that was probably the most stressful thing about the book. Because if you use a picture of an album on anything, um, especially television or in print, you've got to have permission from the record label. And in some artists' cases, they were signed by a label which was bought by, I say, Universal America, who then sold the rights to Universal Europe, who were bought by Virgin. Like, we, you know, <coughs> begin. So that was the biggest stress was finding the permission for, for that one. For Paul Robeson, we asked the National Union of Miners. And the Swansea, and they, you know, it was a small fee, I think it was 50 pounds to, to reproduce the cover. Um, do you have a favourite album cover in the, uh, in the, in the book? Yeah, I do actually. My, fa uh, my favourite um, isn't actually an album, now, unless you've got it here. Well, there's a couple. I mean, this is a favourite. This is by a band from Bethesda in Gwynedd called Matthew and Mr. Hughes, and it's called Husbacepion, which is lots for adverts. And it's paid for by adverts from the local community in Bethesda. So you've got um, uh, a shoe shop called the Dry Gold, got a publishers. You've got the 1983 National Eastern on Anglesey taking out a big advert. Um, you've got Plain Company and a cafe on Bethesda High Street. So yeah, I grew up with that. And my sister, that's my sister actually owns this. I should probably give it back to her. But I grew up with this in the house, and I always loved looking at the adverts, you know. And most of these shops and companies have probably gone now. 
but you know, they all probably contributed a couple of quid, which paid for the so we create credit for credit. the press. Yeah, it's lovely. It's like it's kind of like crowdfunding or something. It is. It is. This 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 homecoming. That's the album cover. This is by Pino Palladino, the world's greatest bassist, who's from the church in Cardiff, where I'm from, and. Uh, yeah, that's the cover. I mean, it's like an inside of an album, really, but so I quite like the practicality of that. But oh, I do have a fit. Oh, here we have. It's actually one of the seven inches. <coughs> uh, I think my, one of my favourites, anyway, is this one by uh, Hoggy and Witva, the Snowden Boys. Um, and I love it because it's on Drew Record, uh, Rand Records, Hoggy and Drew, and it's a little picture of a Drew. A little Ren in the middle. Were they Swansea Valley? They were, uh, the label was, yeah. Ren Records, yes. Uh, yes, it was. And um, I think Sign on it now. Um, is the address on here? Uh, made in, no, the address is not here, but yeah, they were the Ren Records. But that's always been my favourite. I just love the, I think anything that redesigns, like a, a, an idea of Welsh. Uh, Welshness, I like. So that one and this one by uh, Franco, which is the Welsh flag but with sheep instead of a dragon. <laughs> which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Like, we should get rid of the dragon and just put the sheep which actually exists. Um, and this is an amazing album as well. I always talk about this because, um, can I read the back to you, Roger? It says that this album is by an artist called Franco. It's called Gualaxia, Belleville, 1315, Machanfet, 1404. The chance discovery that Belleville, the birthplace of Detroit techno, is twinned with the rural Welsh market town of Machanfet, home of Owen Kendu's rebel Welsh parliament in 1404, led to the creation of Gualaxia. So this is a techno album based on Owen Kendu's and Machanchef. It's like a tribute to the first song on the album called Detroit, Chicago, New York, Machanchef. <laughs> and, um, and it's actually the album I listen to the most watch right it because it's instrumental. Yeah. And if you've ever, you know, if you ever liked anything, I don't know about you, but I can't have any words going on to so get sidetracked. So I'm, this was a good one. I didn't want to listen to classical music because as I've said, isn't it's a classical free zone in this yeah. book. And so uh, yeah, that's the that was a big, uh, that was most played in my headphones whilst I was writing. Great, great. I loved in the book when I found a band or an artist that I have some knowledge of mm. and an awareness of, and then dig into the text and realise this is a, there is a, there is a, there is a story here, there is a human story. Mm. Um, and aware of some of the story around Badfinger. Wow. I mean, because they, you know, again, you think of the connections to Swansea. But I don't know whether you were talking a little bit about the importance of, uh, of Badfinger. Yeah, I mean, the music speaks for itself. 141. 142, thanks. Yeah, the, the music speaks for itself, doesn't it? And it's such an incredibly <coughs> um, sad story, I guess, isn't it? With, with, uh, with suicide, and with um, just massive sadness, really. And yeah, I suppose that's the part of rock and roll and music that is, that's just awful, really, is that mental health aspect and that, that idea of, I don't know, not making it and in a band turmoils and, you know, the emotions of it. Apart from the music, um, that story is just, is fascinating. Um, I won't go into all the details, but you know, I, I passed the, I, every time I go to Swansea, I look at the plaque on the train, I look at the plaque for Pete Ham in the, in the train station there. Um, and uh, yeah, I just thought it was, again, a very sad but interesting story um, for the band. I finished talking that, you know, the song Baby Blue was on the closing scene of Breaking Bad, which was a massive TV hit. And so they continued to get. Um, little snapshots of uh, light showing up onto their music. You know, not least um, the cover, you know, Mariah Carey took uh, Without You, didn't she? Yeah. Turned it into a global hit. Um, it's just, yeah, really sad. That sense of real talent 
uh, hampered by legal battles. Absolutely. And, um, we all, we all getting all caught up in the music industry. Ah, and yeah. that creativity is not allowed to flourish. Yeah. We all know those bands and musicians, don't we? Who are brilliant. And you think, why are they out there? Chance, I know you're a small percentage of artists, like, make it whatever that means, you know. For often, often for bands and artists who are recording, keep going. If it's a journey, there's nobody comes with to, with you, to you with a certificate and says you've made it, you can stop now, you know. It's continuous and um, it's not always healthy. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, talent's only part of, part of it, I think. You know, you've got to want to make, you've got to want to sing, you've got to want to be creative and make do the music. Um, and often not for financial rewards or for fame or anything like that. You've got to do it because you want to do it. Um, and then joining the dots and making those connections are really important. So there's a lot of artists from the last 10 years in the book, you know, who have done exactly that. And wife is one, they're from Carmarthen, um, and they only sing in Welsh. And they are massive at the moment. And they're massive, they tore Europe and they've supported the Mannix and Idols and, you know, um, and they've decided we're only going to sing in Welsh um, for now, for their third album which is coming. So, you know, there's, there's Kate LeBon who's in the book as well, who's from uh, Newcastle Emlyn, who um, is, you know, she's worked really hard um, and built up a repertoire and a solid fan base and she's finally getting, you know, the, the rewards that she, that she deserves. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. You know, there's no right way of making it in music, I've discovered. And it's, you know, it's often that old cliche of who you know, but not in a negative way, not in a, oh, it's who you know, it's a clique over there, we can't do anything about it. It's about, I talk about um, some bands from, from Neath, actually, Murray the Hunter in the book, formed in Aberystwyth, but Matthew Evans from Neath, and, Talk about resolving bands like um, El Bado and um, I don't think I'm going to mention Cubanery, but they were they were also from Resolving Way, and uh, it was, that was really exciting because they were three bands who sort of would play in Cardiff and Swansea and Aberystwyth and go North Wales and go to Oxford and London to gig, and it felt like something was happening there because there was one more than one band from there. Yeah. Um, so that was, I suppose, in a bigger way, that's what happened with the Cool Cymru in the 90s. You know, London journalists would go, oh, there's something happening over there in Wales. We haven't been there in 20 years. Since we sang the alarm, we should probably have it up. <laughs> oh, Stereo Phonics in there. Oh my God, look at it. Of course, the Matnix, yeah, and all the speed up. So it was on a, a more focused version of that. But it's really interesting, you know, you listen to Adam Ogden's show <coughs> in Wales on a Saturday night. And in every show, you'll hear amazing music from every part of Wales that you've never heard before. You yeah. don't know that it's being made. And sometimes it lifts and it grows and it comes over the top and the band becomes, you know, more of a name or more successful or whatever, but yeah. I'm keen to um, allow people to ask you some questions as well, you. But, okay. yeah, but before we do that, and in a sense to bring our conversation maybe full circle, um, in my shortlist, because I took your shortlist of 100 and I tried to just break it down into, into, into five or six that we might talk about today, um, I saw Moon oh, yeah. by Super Fairy Animals. So yeah. I talked about Super Fairy Animals again, both big fans and um, them being an incredibly important um, band. This is the um, only Welsh language album that they released. Yeah. And I'm sure I heard them talk about this album saying it's probably, in terms of the business that it did, their most successful album. I think so, because it was independently released. Yeah. So they were paying for it and reaping the rewards, as opposed to another label releasing it and them taking a cut. And by this point, the Super Fury Animals were a big band, and they were in the top 20, and they were on telly and on the cover of the NME a lot. Um, and so, you know, they did, well in, they did well in America as well, I think. Yeah. You know, to a level. And if you do all right to a level in America, it's enormous. It's the equivalent of making it massive here, kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it did well financially for them. But, you know, artistically, 
Well, I think it's the best of the third of his album. I mean, it's when you say, who knows what's you know, if everyone's got an opinion, and rightly so. Um, and yeah, it's full of only the Welsh language, as he said, um, which made it stand out, but all done naturally because they wanted to. They didn't go, this is our Welsh language album, they went, this is more. And then journalists like me and people went, this is Welsh, why? You know, is this to save the language? Is there a political? And they go, no, it's because we've always said in Welsh, but this yeah. is the chance for us to put this album out. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing them play it at the point. Oh, right, in the Cardiff Bay. Wow. And there was an amazing point in the gig when it was one of the uh, quiet songs, and there were people up in the back end talking, and Griff just stopped. Yeah. He just stopped. So, yeah. It was like some sort of school teacher <laughs> saying, you will wait for me. Yeah. And then when they finally got the point, then you know, they needed to be quiet. He carried, he carried on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There's nothing worse than talk, people talking in gigs. And it often happens in Welsh language gigs as well, because people get together and haven't seen each other for a while. They have a <laughs> chat. <laughs> and they're always like, you about that? Yeah, and it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's, get, it's, it's a bit better now. But um, yeah, it's, it's annoying. I think it's probably what's well, most annoying for the artist, I should imagine. Um, thank you. Um, I think um, I'll ask you if you'd say you'd like to ask you about um, the book or Welsh music. Um, so, are there any questions? Yeah, ask me anything. Denise. <laughs> oh, really, free. They do. They would be in the Mered Evans bit of his legacy passing it on, I think, yeah. They, they, they should be in the book, they could be in the book, there's an that could be in the book. Budgie should be in the book. Uh, Vree could be in there. Trials of Kinto as well. Um, oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They'll be in the next one, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not doing it, but they'll be in the next one. But no, they, they could be in there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I also say control. It's only a hundred records, you know. Thousand in it. It's so, it's so interesting. It's so, we're so lucky in Wales to have so much music uh, around. It's just hard sometimes to know where to begin. So hopefully it can be a good entry point to some artists. This book um, because there's so much. Well, you know, I think we should start using the land of song a bit more as a title. Visit Wales need to start putting money into promoting that or something. I don't know. Just to, because it really is music is everywhere. It comes from every part. And the most surprising place is Underworld are in the book, one of the biggest dance bands in the world. Because Rick's from Ammonford. You know, people don't remember that he's from that he's very, very Welsh. He's Welsh. Um, so yeah, no, re noted. <laughs> Anyone else angry that they're <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying. Yeah. Do you know Mary Oh, yeah, they're in the book. Yeah. <laughs> do you know? I know Matthew, yeah, I do, yeah. Do you know Mary Ann from me? It's from the gangster, right? The Chicago gangster. Related to what? Related to what? David Wigley, right? Yeah, yeah the yeah. client and MP. Who's in the film? Yeah, David Wigley's cousin, well, the relative of David Wigley. A branch of the family emigrated yeah. to Chicago yeah. and he fell into the mafia. Yeah. And he became one of those feared gangsters. You see, these are the stories that I wanted to collect in the book, really. The, the, the bits of trivia yeah. that I remembered and knew. I'm not sure if that Chicago thing is. There was an event here last year in where um, David Wigley came to tell the story mm. of um, his relative. Um, who fell into crime, and it just so happened that the chap who runs the bar here is also related to me, um, and therefore related to David Woodley. Oh, and it was like one of these weird conversations <laughs> about how, how three very different people from very different walks of life, different parts of the world, um, are all, all, all shared the same tier. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad it is in here. I was panicking then. But I didn't put it in. But the first bit is named after a Chicago gangster with Welsh heritage. Maybe that for a band who's cookie deal with them. Yeah. So, yes, it's a good one. It's a good one. I mean, the links are mad. I found out that John Cale went to school with David Ewan. 
They were in the same junior school. John Cale went to Fulham Development Underground in New York with Lou Reed. And I've asked them both separately, Davy, do you remember being in school with John? John, do you remember being? They both said no. <laughs> You'd think they just go, yeah, you know, he's always protesting about something. He's always playing the viola. But Davy, they one's in the book twice. Um, and not um, how he did, but his children's album is in the book. Just because I, I love the the cover, let's find the cover. Um, it's uh, Naughty Crumb Reader Hossing. Uh, a series of children's He did. Songs. Yeah, so this was in the 1970s. So that's in it. But he's the only artist in the book with two records in here, because I also wrote about his single Maggie Thatcher. Um, instead, I was going to do about he, but. It was everywhere at the time, I was bored of it. It was on the news and stuff. I don't know about that now. So yeah, show another one. So Maggie Ma 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 Thatcher. And then, oh, I've got to show you this. I was in a record fair. Um, uh, Tony Schiavone, who sells second hand Welsh records, goes, do you know that man album from Bertha? And he goes, I don't know, I don't actually. It's all 18 quid. Okay, so open it up, and you open it up. Oh, wow. And it's this amazing man's map of Wales, oh, where men are pushing England away. <laughs> and uh, under every, oh look, meets here, uh, it says Eyes of Blue, Spit, very famous. And then it says Neath, Will. So was a member of man called Will from Neath? Does that make sense? I, I was taught the, uh, uh, before. There we go. Oh, Oh, really? So you're taught by a whale that's mentioned in this map? Wow, amazing. Eyes of Blue, I mean, they're a band who, the, yeah, the late drummer from the Six Foot Dolls, Cal Bethan, who perhaps had a sign in Pastor Vegas, he was telling me about Eyes of Blue. And then, um, yeah, I had not heard of them, so they'll, you know, they're what I'm looking out for. Um, yeah. Wow, it's amazing. Thank you very much. So that's the last picture in the book is the uh, is man's map of Wales because it's I just always thought oh, it's so beautiful. So uh, before the maps of where the bands are from, there's like a mini version of that map. And then there's, the, there's a map of record shops as well. Yeah, which um, not that many. Uh, well, there's twenty here. Yeah, no, I suppose. I mean, there's more, but. Time is running out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <coughs> Question. singing a cappella, and uh, I love it. Um, what else do I go back to? Um, yeah, I rediscovered some records that I hadn't heard in a long time, like the Gorky's Iconic Monkey One. Um, there's a harpist in the book called Fiora Lech, who started releasing music in her 60s, and that's beautiful instrumental harp music. Um, and so I go and listen to that quite a bit. Um, yeah. And there's records that I didn't know, like Men of um, John Langford's Men, Men of Gwent was a record I hadn't properly listened to before. Um, and it's great if I ever see like the Shirley Bassey albums in the book now, or I put, you know, I put that on at home sometimes. But yeah, so quite a few. Some of them, like you know, I mean, there's only so much hours in the day, uh, so I can't. I don't listen to lots, but yeah, probably those from all, from all of them, yeah. The gentleman there had a question. Hello. This fellow mentioned Mary. Mary Hopkin. Oh, yes. Yes. I went to the same school as Mary Hopkin. Oh, amazing. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah, me, I do, of course. Yes. Mary Hopkin is in the book. Oh, there you go. And, um, uh, she was one that was quite difficult to get permission to put in, so I put in her EP uh, twice, so you know Mary Hopkin, 
because she liked Matt Boyce, who first released in records in the Welsh language, before I think it was Opportunity Knox, wasn't it, that she went on in English and became famous and signed to Apple Records. And I was with her, I met her ex husband about 10 years ago, Tony Visconti, the great producer. And uh, I said to her, and, you know, we were chatting away, and then um, I said, oh, you know, do, um, do, do what, how much time did you spend in Wales, Tony? No, you don't know, tell me about your ex wife, do you? And <laughs> I was like, do you remember what being in Wales? And he went, I remember being in an Estelle ward. And uh, people with, with Mary's family, and people would come on stage and they would sing the song, and then somebody else would come on and they'd sing the same song, and then a third person would come on and they'd sing the same song again. And I was like, What's going on? And one of Mary's family looked at me and went, It's a competition, Tony. <laughs> He did a Welsh accent. That wasn't me doing the Welsh accent. That was me doing Tony Visconti doing a Welsh accent. And because uh, obviously I have a Welsh accent. So yeah, so he he remembers uh, going to these temples with Mary. And uh, to that, yeah, I mean, what, wait, what a voice. What else can I say? Like, um, I talk about Ponta Dawe, and you know, it's amazing. She doesn't perform anymore, but she still records with her daughter, uh, Jessica Lee Morgan. They put out an album together. Um, quite recently, and she's mass. She tweets a lot. She's on the X platform quite a bit, constantly well, commenting on things and talking about music. But she doesn't publicly appear anymore, from what I understand. Anyway, and that's fair enough, isn't it? Um, Where did she end up? She, she I believe she's still in Ponta Dana. I believe she's still living in the yeah, air, from what I understand. Yeah, S still uh, very close by. She's not here, is she? No. Bonnie and Mary. Yeah. So yeah, no, I definitely have to put Mary in there because what if I wanted to like on the postcard. Because <coughs> I was saying earlier, yeah, it didn't really I mean, the records obviously they do matter. But look, for somebody like Mary Hopkins, it's just important that her book that she was in the, for me, that she was important in the book. And that her story was told, it didn't really matter which record, but you know, I guess. So, in terms of, uh, we, we tell you know a lot more about this, but in terms of the um, history of music, contemporary music, for her to be a woman at that time, breaking through in the way that she did, you know, again, another important figure in terms of Welsh contemporary music. I guess so, yeah, and in the style of like Joan Baez and Johnny Mitchell as well, so there was definitely a uh, a change, wasn't it? Uh, well, that, that, that sort of counterculture, and you know, yeah, the, 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 the way that Welsh culture was shifting. Yeah, um, because it was with all. Yeah, that was there for, for young people to have music, which was reflecting. Yeah, the global changes. Was it? I think so, and it was the time when um, media television was really warming up, wasn't it? And there was Welsh language television programs on the BBC for a couple of hours. So they needed young Welsh singers to sing in Welsh. So Mike Stevens sings in Welsh, Max Boyce was on television. And weirdly, it was Miranda Evans, the folk singer we spoke about at the beginning, who was putting all of these artists on telly. And Ryan and people like that, Ryan and Ronnie. Um, yeah, so there was, I think a lot of them were stepping up. We had the extent of it as well. We had this culture of competing. So opportunity knocks at X Factor, and yeah, yeah. so it's funny when a choir does well on Britain's Got Talent. The other choirs have probably never been on telly, and the Welsh choir has probably been on telly every year for the past 20, 30 years, you know, and know exactly what to do. Um, so that's, yeah. yeah. In terms of that then, though, it's a, you, you remind me of the story of Duffy, mm -hmm. you know, who, when Got Very came out, that album was so, so big. But one of the first things she did was appear on a, a talent competition on SBC. Yeah, wow factor. And famously came second. <laughs> <laughs> she did come second, yeah. That is such a good album, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And that's another one we find in almost every charity shop in the CD section. Huge album and a really good album as well. It's her and Adele, isn't it? There was that there was that rivalry which was manufactured by the media. That's right, because they were two girls singing songs. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, 
you could say your dad as well, because she's still going strong. And, um, but yeah, no, it's, I mean, as we were saying earlier, the music industry, it's not fair, you know, it's not fair at all. Um, especially if you're, you know, you want to compete and you are in a major label world and that kind of thing. I think she made two albums, didn't she, Daffy? And sadly, we haven't heard more. I'm not sure if we ever will, but I know she's been through some terrible times. But um, yeah, so I know it's, it's an interesting one. Yeah, but Duffy is another one who, I guess, a bit like Mary Hopkin. It's all about the voice, isn't it? It all comes back to the voice and the, the talent. Yeah. Any more questions? We can for a couple more. Um, yeah. And four, hello. Um, oh, where do you go? Where do you go first? So there's a giant at the back. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, and I'm looking for the book, um, floor, um, and I see quite a lot of people come in and listen to the music, and a lot of them have to say that they have been influenced very much by way back a tree like oak. Oh, yeah. And there's no sign of a tree like oak, so. No. No. Did they not have any. Oh no, absolutely. Edward H. Bath is on in the book. Um, and then Dead and Lynn from the same sort of importance, I suppose. But they could be easily. Um, it's not to this, you know. It's just that uh, it's only 100 records. And yeah, oh, weirdly, it, it come out as about 50 50 split of Welsh language records and English language records. Not purpose. And also a split between the decades as well. It's quite neat. And that wasn't an on purpose either. It was, I mean, there's three, well, there's one from 1915, which is Ivan Novello, I'll keep going. I'm, I'm uh, going away from your question here, but um, yeah, I, I realised that um, if you were a Welsh speaker, you might never have heard of Bryn Vaughan. Mm. Whereas if you are a Welsh speaker, you're probably sick of Bryn Vaughan because he plays everything. <laughs> so I wanted to write about Bryn Vaughan, and I wanted to write about Gary Jam and and end up Evelyn and people like that in English um, because of, you know, they say language isn't a barrier to music, but if, you, if you're in that world, it can be, can it? But no, true, and I mean, the point is, you could do a book on just like punk bands and just Welsh language records that came out on sign and spoken word records. Um, yeah, but no, true, and Again, noted. Thank you. I think this is going to be our second book. So there are a few hands there. I know Jamie wants to ask a question. You want to write. So is that the back we work our way forward? You mentioned a few musical movements that have happened in Wales. I was just wondering if we were some geopolitical events and you noticed any movement happening there. Happening now? Um, what's happening now? Well, the, what's up, there's no what's happening. There's, um, what's exciting? Um, the black music scene in Wales is on fire at the moment. I was at a gig a couple of weeks ago called Welcome to Wales, where a lot of the MCs and singers were performing on the same lineup. It was incredible. It makes the great Ed Lightning, who is in the book, and he's a kind of rapper. Uh, there's Luke Harvey from Neath the Talbot as well, who was great. He was at the gig. So that scene's on fire at the moment, doing exciting things. Um, and what else is happening? There's, there's always lots of music being made, but I think that's probably the most um, together cohesive. Do you think we'll see uh, any sort of protest movements or like punk movements relating to what's happening around the area? Well, what, why is it, what do you mean uh, related? Well, we're to the steelworks, the oh, yeah. effects of COVID. Um, okay. I mean, a lot of bands who you think are going to write about what's happening locally, politically, you expect them to, and some just don't, and they want music to be escapism, and you've got to respect that, I think. Um, I think rap music does that in pretty much every record, reflects what's going on locally. Um, especially, like, I talk in the book, like, after the US, because he was born in the States, and then there was UK rap, and that then rapping in an English accent, and then the boom in Welsh rap uh, in English has been amazing. And that kind of, by the nature of it, I think, reflects what's going on on the street, even if it's super local. So it makes the great raps about slot in Cardiff. You know, Luke Harvey is proud to be from Leith for Talbot, but it's also people can identify with it wherever they're listening. So, um, 
Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think the worry with some political lyrics is that I guess some bands think that they're not going to get played on platforms which have to be neutral, like, I don't know, the BBC or something. Um, but that's not always true. I mean, you know, there's, there's definitely, you know, you're allowed to have opinions and politicals in songs. Um, as long as they're not offensive, I guess. Um, so yeah, I hope artists and bands do sing because uh, protest songs are important, isn't it? Yeah, very important. Um, definitely a question. Um, you mentioned your engagements in the past with Cantu, Tom Jones, and Tom Turner quite shortly. Um, I recorded an interview last week with Dino and Fabiana and Paladino on the radio. Are there any artists um, from the book uh, that you really want to have a discussion with, you know, deep dives that are part of their record, past or present? I'd love to meet Shirley Bassey. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to chat to her. Um, we did try once, but it just wasn't possible, unfortunately. Um, I think, but no, I mean, yeah, probably should, probably Dean Shirley. I've had a great idea of you. You know, you, um, Hugh, some of you might have seen it, he has a TV series with the uh, news presenter, Becky George. Oh, we did one on the series, yeah. Where you travel around Wales, staying in the nicest hotel. It was a tough, it was a tough job, that was just a long time to... You see, you and Shirley travel around the much countryside. Imagine that. <laughs> four by four. She'd be in like six star hotels, and I'd be in the easy hotel. If you ever stayed in an easy hotel, don't. And if you do, don't do what I do and go, See the tenor by not having a window. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but uh, you know, no, I'd love 